Hi, uh, my name is Max von Hippel, and today I'm going to be presenting automated attacker synthesis for distributed protocols. This is work that I did with my collaborators Cole Vick and Stavros Chapakis, as well as my advisor Christina Nidorotaru at Northeastern University over the fall of 2019 and the early spring of 2020. To begin, let's suppose you have a functioning distributed system. When I say distributed system, what I mean is a system with many different components, and those components do not share their computation. They compute separately. They can communicate over some channels of communication, and in that way, they can effectively accomplish shared computation, but it's really a different thing because they're separate siloed components that simply communicate with one another. Moreover, assume that this distributed system has a known network topology and set interfaces. What do I mean by this? When I say topology, I do not mean it in the mathematical sense, but rather in the standard network science sense. Effectively, there are only certain boats that can talk to certain other boats. So each boat or ship has a uh, communicator of some sort on it, waving semaphores around, classical flags used to communicate in the harbor. And um, there might be some rules of who can communicate with who. So for instance, maybe a boat can only communicate with another boat if they're sufficiently close to one another geographically, or if they are part of the same armada. By interfaces, what I mean is that there are only certain flags and messages that can be sent or received. So naturally, a uh, communicator cannot receive a message that they haven't been trained to receive. And likewise, they can only send a message if they both know how to send it and have the correct flags to do it. Moreover, let's assume that this entire system with its set topology and its set interfaces satisfies some logical specification. So we have some charter of the harbor. This is a rule set which says what exactly the harbor is allowed to do with all of its different components how should the system with the components all composed together uh, behave? What should it satisfy? So for instance, two boats should never collide with one another. So we might say that if everyone follows the rules and they all communicate with each other, they'll never have an accident, they'll never collide into each other. And this double turnstile symbol means satisfaction or models or makes true. As effectively, it means that the system on the left makes the specification on the right true. It satisfies the specification. An interesting question becomes, if I can bribe Alice and Marley, can I make the entire system violate a specification? So let's say that Alice is the person who's been replaced with the big blue word Alice, and Marley is the person who's been replaced with the big green word Marley. If I can bribe each of them to behave in some way other than how they otherwise would have behaved, then can I induce the entire system to violate the Charter of the Harbor? Now, just for uh, clarity, I'll mention before we move forward, that the problem we solve is not for exactly two uh, uh, vulnerable processes, but for arbitrarily many. So um, I'm going to be using an example with n equals two, but this example equally applies to n equals six or n equals one or whatever. My to-do item for today is to automatically synthesize some replacement for Alice and some replacement for Marley, such that when I pull Alice and Marley out of the system and I replace them with the replacements, the modified system or augmented system should violate the specification. So the charter of the harbor should contain some rule such that the entire system at some point may violate that rule. So I've given you a informal problem definition. Next, I'm going to go over some prior approaches and, and related problems, which serve as inspiration for our own approach. After that, I'll explain our approach. Then we will dive into a case study, namely TCP. For TCP, we'll discuss some prior results, so attacks that have been found against TCP in the past, as well as our own results. I'll clarify now that when I say TCP, I'm not referring to the entire protocol of TCP, but rather just the connection establishment and teardown fragments of the protocol. Finally, I'll explain some deliverables of this project and we will conclude. So there are many different problem domains in protocol security. I'm going to mention a few, and when I do so, I'm in no way exhausting the field of protocol security, but rather explaining what I and my collaborators were thinking about when we developed our approach. And you'll see how some classical techniques inspired our own technique. First of all, many protocols have cryptologic flaws. These are flaws arising from the cryptographic logic of the protocol. Many protocols have what my advisor Christina would call semantic bugs. These are the types of flaws that are studied in the field LangSec or language security. Essentially, these are flaws having to do with the parsing of the input symbols to the language. So you might have some data language that is processed by some computer or some program, and that data language turns out to have more expressive power than intended. And so an adversary able to control some part of the input data can, as a result, manipulate the entire system. There are also all sorts of logical flaws that can arise in a protocol. We're all familiar with the uh, typical bugs that we read about on Hacker News, where somebody has two equal signs instead of one, and it compiles nonetheless. These are logical flaws. Um, logical flaws also arise from misused if-else statements or 
famously from misused go-to statements. Dijkstra has written very beautifully about this topic. Many protocols have statistical flaws, leading perhaps to information leakage or other types of statistical issues. These types of problems are studied, for example, in the field of epsilon differential privacy. Moreover, in formal methods, which is the camp that I mostly reside in, we often discuss implementation flaws. You can have a protocol or an algorithm that, abstractly speaking, is correct. Perhaps you implement it in the Hall theorem prover or something similar, and you prove that it satisfies all the logical properties you expect it to satisfy. However, when finally implemented, the ultimate implementation does not satisfy those properties. So there's some disparity between the abstract specification, the abstract program, and the concrete implementation. This is something that Stavros has studied, and uh, there's a good body of literature on the topic in the formal methods field. Many prior approaches exist to address each of these different problem domains. Fuzzing or grammar combinators are techniques that can exhaust an input space, usually in an intelligent rather than naive manner, in order to yield, for example, semantic bugs or implementation flaws. Model checking and formal verification are areas of formal methods, which are often used to uncover cryptologic flaws, various kinds of semantic bugs or logical flaws, among other things. And again, this mapping is not completely exhaustive, but mostly represents sort of the way that we were thinking about these problems and approaches as we thought about how we wanted to approach the problem. Many security researchers use different types of static or dynamic analysis. And often these analysis techniques are motivated by expert heuristics. So you might, for instance, have some way to abstract a control flow graph from a program and then have some expert heuristics about what exactly would constitute a bad CFG. Many types of expert mathematical analyses exist that don't fall into any of the prior camps. And this is perhaps controversial, but I would say that machine learning sort of is a type of expert mathematical analysis, essentially the automation of statistics. Okay, so what is our approach? Let's start with a high level, and then we will go to a lower level. In other words, we will have iterative depth. The first step of our approach is to formally model the system using an algebra of communicating processes. Formally speaking, these processes are Kripke structures with inputs and outputs, but that does not matter enormously for understanding the technique. So I will refrain from getting into the formal details unless there are questions at the end. The second step of our approach is to model attacker actions using daisy gadgets. Now, for the moment, it's sufficient to understand that daisy gadgets are sort of like grammar combinators or fuzzers. They will exhaust an input space to some system. And step three is that these daisy gadgets will hopefully find a violating behavior. In fact, if a violating behavior exists, then we can prove that given infinite time, eventually uh, a violating behavior will be found. And we then take that violating behavior, so some behavior of the modified system using the daisy gadgets, and we use it to build an attacker that reproduces the behavior. So we don't simply find a witness to an attack, we actually create a replicating program that can replay the attack for you. And this is an important difference between our own approach and that of similar papers. All right, so let's go over that in more detail. The first step was to define a formal threat model. What exactly does this mean? It turns out that there is not a generally agreed upon way to algebraically model threat models. In fact, the very definition of a threat model is slightly contentious. We take an opinionated approach in this paper, and we say that a threat model should capture the environment, namely all of the parts of the system that cannot be modified by the attacker, the vulnerabilities, namely the components of the system we assume the attacker can change or modify or molest or replace, and the property, namely the part of the specification for the system that the attacker hopes to violate. So the negation of the property is the attacker goal. In our case, Alice and Marley would be the vulnerabilities. We are assuming that Alice and Marley can be replaced or modified or molested or changed in some sense by the adversary, by the attacker. However, all of the other boats are the environment. These are the components of the system that are invariant. They cannot be changed by the attacker. So we have a sort of assume guarantee style of reasoning morally speaking, not formally speaking, where the environment cannot be changed by the adversary. Finally, the charter of the harbor is the property that the adversary wants to negate. So the goal of the adversary is to cause any negation whatsoever of the charter of the harbor. Step two is to replace Alice and Marley with daisies. More generally, we are replacing the vulnerable processes with daisies. What is a daisy? The daisy of Alice is the process that non-deterministically exhausts all infinite sequences of communication events in the interface of Alice. So as I said before, Alice has some interface I-O. I are the inputs that Alice can read. So for instance, semaphore, white semaphore zero through white semaphore K, and O are the outputs that Alice can send. So for instance, black semaphore zero through black semaphore J. 
On the left, we have pseudocode representing what the daisy of Alice does. And on the right, we have the standard graphical representation for automata or Kripke structures. So while true, Alice's daisy non-deterministically chooses either an input or an output. If the choice was an input, then Alice's daisy waits until some other process sends that input, at which point Alice's daisy receives a message and loops again. If the choice was an output, then Alice's daisy sends the output. I'll mention now that our algebra uses rendezvous composition with multicasting. This is a form of composition frequently used in modeling distributed systems, as for example, in previous work by Stavros. On the right, we have a graphical representation. There's one state, Q0, which represents the internal state of the loop. Now, each action that could happen in the loop is a self loop from Q0 to Q0. We use ha or question mark to mean receive and bang or exclamation mark to mean send. So the self loop from Q0 to Q0 labeled white flag not question mark or white semaphore not ha huh, is the loop in which the daisy of Alice receives the message white flag or white semaphore number zero from some other process. Likewise, the self loop from Q0 to Q0 on the bottom left labeled by black flag J bang or black semaphore J exclamation mark is the self loop in which the daisy of Alice sends the black flag semaphore number j to the world. All right, so we've now invented daisies and we'd like to know how to use them. The natural inclination is exactly right, which is that we will replace Alice with the daisy of Alice and we will replace Marley with the daisy of Marley. Now let's take this augmented system and model check it. A model checker is a program that takes as input a system and a specification. It then tries to find a behavior of the system that violates the specification. We make the assumption that the model checker will eventually find a behavior violating the specification if such a behavior exists, or will report that no behavior exists otherwise. And in particular, we let R be the set of violating behaviors. For the subsequent slides, we are going to assume that R is non-empty, that is, that some violating behavior exists. We actually prove in the extended preprint of our paper on archive that under our assumptions about the model checker, a violating behavior is found if and only if an attacker could exist. So our approach is both sound and complete. Let's assume that little r is a violating run in big R. By run, what we mean is a sequence of states connected by transitions in the natural manner of the composed system consisting of all of the other boats in the harbor, plus the daisy of Alice and the daisy of Marley. This run has states, S0, S1, S2, etc. And in between each state is a transition labeled by some send or receive event. So for instance, in the violating run presented, in the first transition from S0 to S1, the checkered semaphore number two is sent. Then in the transition from S1 to S2, the checkered semaphore number 11 is received. And then after that, number zero is received. And then after that, number six is received. And the number 99 is sent. And the number two is sent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The next step is that we project the run onto Alice and Marley. So I've helpfully colored blue the events that are in the interface of Alice and green the events that are in the interface of Marley. Of course, an event could be in the interfaces of both, and we handle that in the natural way, but for the purpose of a simple presentation, I'm not graphically representing that in this particular example. Now, before I proceed, a uh, natural objection would be to say, what if this run is infinitely long? How are you gonna handle that? And the answer is that a LTL model checker is going to give us back omega regular runs, which means that they are of the form A followed by B, 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 B forever, where A is some string and B is some string. So essentially, you only need to know A and B in order to know everything. And that's sort of the magic of using linear temporal logic for model checking. Once we projected this run onto Alice and Marley, effectively figuring out what the daisy of Alice did and what the daisy of Marley did, the next step is to translate those projections into processes. So if what the daisy of Alice did in this run is that it first sent checkered flag number two, then received checkered flag number six, and then sent checkered flag number two, let's simply create a process that does exactly that. It starts with some initial state, it then does a transition to a second state where it sends checkered flag number two. It does a transition to a third state where it receives checkered flag number six, and that's a self loop where it sends checkered flag number two. So this is quite natural. We simply create a replaying process. Now we're not always going to use self loops. There are some subtleties depending on exactly what version of this problem we want to solve. For the purposes of this presentation, the self loop representation is adequate and explains the basic moral approach taken. 
the attacker is then considered to be the tuple of the attacking processes or the replaying processes. So ultimately, the daisies are not a very interesting answer because certainly they might be able to attack, but they can do all sorts of other things that uh, that do not constitute an attack. And what we want to do is get a replaying attacker, a reproducing attacker. So the reproducing attacker is the tuple containing the components needed uh, in order to reproduce the particular attack that was found. In this case, the attack represented in the run R. All right, so you've seen our general approach. Now let's talk about some subtleties to our approach, namely the fact that there are different categories of attackers which have to be handled differently. On the x-axis, we have with versus without recovery. The intuition here is that I could tell you a particular system is, for example, vulnerable to an infinite length DDoS attack. But ultimately, an infinite length distributed denial of service is not very interesting because nobody has the resources to do DDoS forever and ever and ever. Therefore, what we're really interested in in many situations are finite length attacks, attacks that do some finite number of adversarial steps followed by some sort of recovery to normal behavior, which is to say that when we say recovery, we don't mean that the attack is somehow undone. What we mean by recovery is that eventually the attacking processes revert to the actual copy pasted code from the processes they replaced. So the attacker component that replaced Alice would have some finite number of steps. And then after that, it would literally have the copy pasted code from Alice. An attack without recovery is basically what we already presented. So with recovery is a more difficult problem than without. On the y-axis, we have for all attackers versus exist attackers. The intuition here is that a for all attacker is one in which the attacker components, when composed with the rest of the system, will violate the charter of the harbor in every possible run or every behavior. So there's no run in which the charter of the harbor is not violated by all the ships. On the other hand, an exist attacker will have some run or some runs in which the charter of the harbor is violated, but there will also be some runs in which it's not violated. Now you may think, how is that possible? And the answer is because the other parts of the system, so for instance, the other ships in the harbor may or may not actually be deterministic. They could have some non-deterministic transitions. The Cartesian product of these two ways of differentiating attackers yields a set of four problems. The R for all ASP is the attacker synthesis problem for attackers with recovery that are for all attackers. The for all ASP is the generic for all attacker attacker synthesis problem. The R exists ASP is the attacker synthesis problem for exist attackers with recovery. And naturally, the exists ASP is the generic exists attacker synthesis problem. The two problems in green are those solved in this paper, and the two problems in orange remain open for future work. For the green problems, the exists ASP was already presented to you in the previous slides, and the R exists ASP is basically the same, but with a slight modification to the property that is the chart of the harbor in order to guarantee that all the attacking processes eventually recover in the violating run, and with a slight modification to the daisies so that they actually have a recovery component to them. All right, so at this point, I've given you our problem definition. I've explained some prior approaches and inspired our own. I've shown how we were inspired by grammar combinators and fuzzers to use the daisy gadget, how we were inspired by expert mathematical analysis, as well as static and dynamic analysis to do this violating run based approach, especially where we automatically extract a reproducing attacker. I've shown how we use a model checker in order to find a vulnerability and then ultimately get to the point where we can reproduce that vulnerability. So I've shown how we were inspired by a number of problem categories and prior approaches. Next, I presented our approach uh, for the exist ASP. I explained the different attacker categories and I gave a loose intuition for how we handled the recovery exist ASP. The next step of the presentation is to go over a case study, namely TCP. TCP is the transmission control protocol, which is part of the internet architecture or the modern World Wide Web. TCP guarantees reliable delivery of messages and is used in scenarios where the reliability of the delivery and the integrity of the message are more important than the speed of the delivery. So for instance, if you're watching a movie on Netflix, it's more important that the frames get to you quickly so that the movie doesn't slow down and then speed up and then slow down and then speed up. Then it is that the frames are perfect and therefore you could have some pixels flip or maybe lose a few frames, go down in the rate of frames per second temporarily if the network drags and that's fine as long as it doesn't have to pause and buffer. Whereas with email, it's actually unacceptable for words to get flipped around or bits to get flipped in your email. You would rather have the recipient wait longer to receive the email, but have the email be correct than have them get it instantaneously, but with some errors. So TCP is used for the latter category of communication in which the message needs to reliably be received by the receiver, and it needs to not be messed up. You don't want to have any bits flipped or anything like that. In particular, we're going to focus on TCP connection establishment and teardown, which together we call the TCP connection routine. First, we'll go over prior results for TCP, namely prior attacks that were found against TCP, and then our own results. After that, as I said before, we'll go over deliverables and our conclusion.
TCP was originally proposed in May 1974 by Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, who went on to ultimately win the Turing Award for their work on TCP. Since then, many attacks have been found against TCP, and interestingly, a lot of these attacks are similar in nature. We have a predictable sequence number attack in 1985. This would be a statistical flaw. Then the scene flood attack, this is a semantic bug. Desynchronization, then the scene received to close weight, that's another semantic bug, also a logical flaw. Then the reset attack, again, a semantic bug. Then act division, a statistical flaw, dupe act spoofing, an optimistic act, then predictable sequence numbers, again, statistical, then the reset attack. This, again, is another semantic bug or a length set type bug. Then the opt act DOS, the shoe attack, the induced shoe attack, the blind flooding attack, which is another semantic flaw with some statistical aspects to it. The act storm, again, a semantic flaw with some statistical aspects to it. Sequence inference attacks three times in a row, more sequence inference attacks, and finally, our own work. So what do we see when we look at this? Well, obviously there's a bunch of attacks that involve some statistical understanding of TCP, but also there's a lot of semantic bugs. And these are really interesting because you would think that with a finite state machine, which TCP is, one could exhaust all of the semantic bugs um, using model checking with an approach similar to ours. In fact, a lot of these bugs can be found by simply drawing the state machine for TCP on a large whiteboard and analyzing it manually. That's not to in any way put down the work that was done by Cerf and Kahn or others in the past, but rather to say that a formal and algebraic approach appears to be a good approach for finding attacks in TCP and presumably for finding attacks against similar protocols. We ask two main questions and we don't really answer either, but they motivate our work. The first is how many of these attacks could have been automatically synthesized? The reason we have not yet answered this is because in order to do so, we would need a complete logical specification for TCP covering all of the properties that are violated by each of these prior attacks. That's actually quite the endeavor and not something we're done with. The second question that's interesting is how many attacks remain unknown? Or in other words, could we discover a novel attack? I'll tell you right now that we don't, but we make first steps toward being able to do so. Let's go over TCP. We model TCP as having two symmetric peers. So these peers are processes, or cryptic structures, automata, whatever you'd like to call them, that are symmetric in nature. They have the same basic state machine. I'll show it to you in, in a moment. Um, and these peers communicate over a network. In between the peers in the network are one message buffers called channels. Um, for those of you familiar with Promella, these are simply Promella channels of size one. And the intuition here is that messages are not actually sent and received instantaneously over real world networks. Since TCP reckons with the reality of delay in message sending and receiving, we thought it was important to model that. And therefore we added these channels, which can non-deterministically allow for a delay in sending and receiving of messages and thereby model a more realistic network. Finally, in the center, we have a process called network, which unmolested or unmodified by the adversary simply takes messages from one side and passes them to the other side. In theory, this network process abstracts all of the other parts of the internet that can connect two TCP peers. We attack the network. So we essentially say, imagine that the two peers are working correctly, but there's something uh, adversarial about the connection between them. What could an adversary do on path in between the two peers? Let's go over the two peers. We have a state machine for the peers, which is symmetric in nature. And the state machine builds on both that that is in the ASCII RFC and also the state machines in prior works. For example, the work of Samuel Giro and Christina. Um, Essentially, we have the same state machine that's used by everybody else, but we do not allow multiple events to happen in a given transition. And so, for instance, going from listen to scene received, a scene message is received, and then a scene act is sent. So we split this into two events with a implicit state I2 in the middle. Um, there's a subtlety about the way that we use time weight that uh, the astute observer will notice differs from some state machines. But in terms of the models being checked, it doesn't matter, and um, it's actually deliberate in order to make the model checking a little bit faster. So if there's questions about that at the end, I'm happy to answer them. So TCP peers are symmetric by definition, and as a side effect, the properties are actually easier to formulate because we don't need to consider uh, two versions of a property depending on the symmetry of the property. We can simply consider one version in which one peer does one thing and the other peer does the other thing. So what are our results? Um, we have three properties. The first is that there should be no half-closed connection establishment. This is a property that's mentioned multiple times in the RFC. And what it basically means is that you don't want to have one peer believe that it is in an established connection with the other when the other peer is not. So if a peer believes it is established a connection, it should have actually established a connection. We were able to automatically find seven attackers without recovery and five with recovery. An example of an attacker was one that spoofs an active participant in an active passive connection establishment routine. And this is a 
fairly natural attacker. It's one that you would probably come up with given the state machine if you were asked to do so on paper. And in fact, it's a attack strategy that has been proposed by prior security researchers. The second property we check is that passive active connection establishment should eventually succeed. So a subtlety of our TCP peer model is that each peer can do active establishment, active teardown, passive establishment, or passive teardown. This is important because many prior models have a server client assumption in which each peer could only do one set of behaviors. We we're able to find five attackers without recovering five with. An example attacker is one that drops a scene packet sent from peer two, thereby deadlocking the system in the product state scene sent scene receipt. And it turns out that there are actual TCP peers uh, or TCP implementations in the wild where this bug can arise naturally from packet loss. Our third and final property is that peers do not get stuck. At first glance, this appears to be a deadlocking property, but it's not exactly deadlocking because deadlocking would mean that the entire system is not going through any transitions. And this is the property where it's only the peers that are not transitioning, but the other parts of the system, for example, the channels in the network might be. We're able to find four attackers without recovery and five with. An example attacker is one that dropped an ACK sent from Peer 1, leaving Peer 2 stranded in scene received. You'll notice that this is actually a pretty similar attack strategy to that used in the prior attack of dropping a scene from Peer 2. So it turns out that if you simply go off of the state machine description in the RFC, there are multiple places where a TCP peer could not recover from a particular packet being dropped. Interestingly, inspection of the Linux kernel will show that the TCP implementation in the Linux kernel does not have these bugs. This seems to suggest that there is some folklore knowledge of TCP as implemented, for example, in the Linux kernel, which goes beyond that specified in the RFC. So finally, we'll conclude. First and foremost, we have the deliverable of an open source implementation of our approach called Quark using the spin model checker and Promela specification. This tool is available online at the given URL, and we have a full documentation website for the tool. Second, we found realistic attackers against TCP in a matter of seconds or minutes. We have an extended preprint released on Archive. This is worth looking at in its own right, separate from the SafeCon paper being presented today, because it includes detailed mathematical proofs and slightly more figures. I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the presentation.